influenced by Islam to the presumption of innocence. And you can find this in an academic article published in 1980 by Marcel Boissard. It's called On the Probable Influence of Islam on the Presumption of Innocence. Okay, it's not a key argument. There's many arguments of why the presumption of innocence came about. But there, he, there is an influencing factor from the teachings of Islam which came by Muhammad upon him. The next time you smoke some weed, you get caught, then you know you're innocent to proven guilty because of Muhammad. What was the last point? Are you black? Yeah, that's it. Right. Tolerance. The reason we can live in a country like Britain, and we're proud to be in this country, I was proud to, born, to be born here, the reason, the reason we're proud is not because oh, you know, we have some kind of uh, blind nationalism. I mean, we're not animals, yeah? Like, we're protecting our kind of field, yeah? It's not. It's because we like some of the principles here. Of course we do. There's a lot we need to change, of course, but, you know, we don't live in a utopia, and we don't live in paradise. We're not yet anyway, so we've got, we've got a bit of hard work to get there first. But the point is, one key thing is, is, is looking at your faces. Brown, yellow, brown, red. You know, we're different, right? And we're all here under the same kind of umbrella, and this is because of tolerance. And I would argue a key aspect of this is because of Muhammad. Upon you, he's thinking that this guy is definitely a religious fanatic. He's crazy. He doesn't know what he's talking about. No, I'm going to give you references, okay? Now, who's heard of John Locke? Hey, philosophy students? Good. Tabula Rasa, yeah? I don't believe that, by the way. I don't believe that. He's a hardcore criticism. I don't like people like that. But anyway. But anyway, John Locke, he was known more for his politics, I think, which we respect him for that rather than his empiricism, okay? Now, what did John Locke say? He wrote various treaties on tolerance. He wrote on civil governance, and he influenced American politics, European politics, uh, conceptions on tolerance in such a huge way. Now, according to the book Islam in the West, by, I believe, by Christopher J. Walker, I think his name is, or J. Walker, it writes, so the author says that John Locke was heavily influenced by only one man. And this man was called Edward Pocock. Now, Edward Pocock was the first Orientalist. He traveled to the East and took his manuscripts. And he would teach Islamic studies at Oxford. And John Locke would write in his personal writings and letters that he would love to sit in front of only one man. And that man is Edward Pocock. And he was heavily influenced by him. And you could see this subtly. You know on civil governance, for example, John Locke's works, what does he write? Well, how does he describe the relationship between the ruled and the ruler? It begins with a V. A vicegerency. He describes it as a vicegerency. Translate that into Arabic. Anyone know? Khalifa. Khalifa. Vice-gerency means Khalifa. Khalifa is a key political concept in the Islamic tradition. It's a word mentioned by the Quran itself, being a vice for the world and for the earth. That, you can even argue, is like a direct copy of Islamic political thinking in the 16th, 17th, and 18th century. Go check out Western sources for yourself. You probably think I'm mad. I am mad, but that's a different personal issue, yeah? I'm talking about what I'm telling you is real. This is real stuff, bro. Wake up and smell the play doh because we're all children. We don't know this stuff. We always accuse Muhammad of being this and of being that, and we and we, we curse him, we abuse these figures because we haven't told them, told people who he is, us Muslims. We are at fault in this narrative because we don't say who Muhammad is. We're, we're too scared, we call him Mo now. Yeah? Or whatever. We have all these kind of inferiority complexes. And that's 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 it's a disease. And and, and the non-Muslims the wider society, rather, you know, should be slightly ashamed as well. Because, come on, you're going to believe Fox News for the rest of your life, or Sky News? Let's scratch the surface here. Let's find out who this person was. So you see this nice introduction? iPhone, scientific revolution, presumption of innocence, and tolerance. Okay? So there's the introduction to Muhammad al Hindu peace. Now let's talk about his legacy without boring you too much. Now I think this is one of this is one amazing key cogent argument for the validity of the Islamic tradition. Now I'll argue not many people are in this room today, which that's quite a few actually for Sussex, but 
Generally speaking, there's not that many people in this room. It's because we live in a post-secular society which basically says religion is backward, it's irrational. No matter what kind of fancy marketing you give me, uh, I live in such a socialized environment that religion is, is a boogie thing. It's, it's, a, it's the boogie man. It's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm open-minded, but I'm going to be that open-minded. My brain is going to fall out, yeah? And I'm going to allow religion to come into that narrative. Forget it. No way, Jose. Yeah? And, and that's the dangerous thing. And the reason it's dangerous is because we don't have an environment where we can articulate a positive case for religion or faith or traditional thinking. And I think we can. And this argument I'm going to give you is it not only talks about his legacy, but talks about how we can use his life to show that he was really a prophet and he was divinely inspired. And it's a very simple argument. Now, the Prophet Muhammad called me peace, he came into the 7th century, he was born in the 7th century in an environment where there was a lot of injustice. They used to bury the daughters alive because, you know, having your firstborn being a daughter was a huge dishonor amongst the Arabs, okay? And what they used to be some unjust economic practices, they used to be slavery, they used to be, I mean, it was, it was like a new form of prostitution. It used to be tents with a flag on top. And that meant that anyone could come inside. Anyone. Yalla, khalas, everybody, yeah? As the Arabs say, yeah? And, and for her to find out if, if, if she was pregnant, which one was the father, she would do a, a facial analysis. You know, that was like DNA testing of the time, wasn't it? Yeah? Uh, it must be you. Yeah? And, and, and that was the reality of the time. It, it wasn't a problem. Women were actually born and sold, they were treated as uh, prized possessions. Uh, I don't even think they could own anything, especially if they came from a particular tribe. There was tribal warfare, they would fight over a camel. They would fight over camels, yeah? Um, so the, there were so many crazy issues at the time. And Muhammad al he came and he actually turned everything upside down. You know, his, his, his narrative of La ilaha illallah, there is no divine reality where they worship but the divine reality, that statement itself was not only spiritual and profound and existential, what it means to exist, but it was political in nature. It changed everything. It means you can't worship your false gods anymore. Those 360 gods that you have in the Kaaba, in the Black Cube in Mecca, you know, you can't worship those anymore. And if you can't worship them, then you must destroy them. And if you destroy them, then you can't have these trade routes and all these different people from other places coming just to worship these gods and you could trade together. Therefore, it affected the economic social reality. I mean, the Prophet Muhammad put me peace, he was the real, uh, what's that thing called? What did it in New York? Occupy New York. Okay, Wall Street. He was the Occupy Mecca. That was the Prophet Muhammad put me peace. He not only had a spiritual doctrine, but he changed things politically. He said no more injustice concerning uh, economics. And this is why he had amazing economic geopolitical principles. For example, in one prophetic tradition, he says the human being all they need is food, shelter, and clothing. Look at the amazing geopolitics that you may think, oh, that's common sense. But is it really? Is it? Is it really? I mean, we're in capitalism, right, generally speaking, and it's the biggest weapon of mass destruction in, in, in ever existed capitalism, in my humble opinion. Go to the UNDP reports. 20 million children dying every, what, six years? Because of no food? But we have enough food? Because their geopolitics is wrong. What does liberal capitalist model say? It says, you know what? There's too many needs, not enough resources. That's why you have the bloody iPhone. You know that? You know, what's his name? Jobs. He had no marketing. He said, forget it. I'm a consumerist by heart and nature. I'm going to tell you what you need. And I'm going to have it ready for you. Problem, reaction, solution. I create a problem that doesn't exist. You react, I know your reaction. I give you the iPhone. The solution. That's what consumerism is. Did you really need the iPhone five years ago? Did you really need it? Do you need the new jacket that said CK on it rather than Primark? Did it make a bloody difference? No, it didn't. The irony is that some Primark probably has CK jacket, but it just doesn't have the you know the little mistake on it. It's probably the same thing anyway. It's different label. <laughs> but that's consumerism for you. That's the problem. Did you need to have the choice between sushi and curry fried sushi? I mean, I was in Orange County in America, and the man, I've never seen so much sushi in my life. I mean, I know it's hypocritical, I have 15 plates, yeah? <laughs> but they're very small, and you digest it very quickly, you get hungry after an hour anyway, yeah? But the point is, you have all these options. Options about everything. I mean, look, Sky News. Do 
you see that? I didn't, what's his name? Man versus food. Have you watched that? No, I want you. That's, 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 the human project has failed. They have competitions on man versus food. They eat this huge thing. Can, can you eat it in an hour or not? People are vomiting and uh, the, uh, it's just disgusting, right? So that's consumerism for you. 